Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Commonwealth Club program. Today's program is part of our Good Lit series. Uh, those who have authored books are invited to speak at the club, and that's underwritten by the Bernard Osher Foundation. As you all know, I'm Gloria Duffy, president and CEO of the club, and very pleased to be the moderator, conversationalist with our distinguished visitor today. Joining us, as you all know, is the Honorable John Kerry, highly decorated Vietnam veteran, former US Secretary of State, U.S. Senator, former presidential candidate, and author of the new memoir, Every Day is Extra. From his role as a Vietnam veteran, uh, questioning and educating about the war, to running for president in 2004 and serving as Secretary of State, John Kerry has provided leadership as a military officer, an activist, an elected official, and an appointed cabinet secretary. He's experienced American politics across a very broad range of institutions and eras. His recent memoir delves into his relationships with other major political figures, his views on recent American trends, uh, such as hyperpartisanship, and his role in significant political moments like the Iran nuclear deal. We're so excited to have him with us here today to discuss these issues as well as the future of our democracy. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a warm welcome to John Kerry. So uh, tell us, you sat down and wrote this book. What stimulated you to become so reflective about the span of your life and your service? Well, first of all, let me begin by, by saying thank you to uh, Gloria, to the Commonwealth Club. I, I really am happy to be here. This is a great organization. Um, I've had the privilege of being part of your conversations previously or even just making a speech. Uh, and it's really fun to be back in one of my favorite cities in the world, San Francisco, so I'm happy to be here. Uh, and thank you all for <clears throat> taking the time to come out, and I hope uh, it's sort of part of your checklist in terms of good citizenship, because we have a lot to talk about right now. <laughs> uh, we really do. Um, I, I mean, the question of what are facts in life, how do we make our politics work, there's so much to talk about. I was, uh, the other day I noticed, this really is true, uh, there was a report on Infowars that Hurricane Lane that was bearing down on Hawaii had been split in two by an energy beam that was fired from Antarctica by me. <laughs> um, and and I, I thought, well, I, I, th I thought to myself, man, we have really, uh, c this is terrible stuff. How can they? How did they miss the fact that I fired it from from the North Pole? <laughs> uh, but seriously, I'm very upset that they haven't called me to action for Florence coming in on the East Coast. But this is just we're dealing with uh, a whole different world. And for those of us who really do love our country and who consider ourselves patriots and who uh, honor the role of truth in the sustaining of our democracy, uh, this is a very perilous and important moment. So I look forward very, very much to the conversation. Thank you. I know there'll be lots of questions from the audience, but tell us again, why did you at this do time this? sit down um, and reflect on your long career? I thought career? I could slide by that. <laughs> I think you actually, you gave part of the answer. No, 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 no. I, yeah, I did give part of the answer. I, I did it because I think it's relevant to the moment that we're in. I think Bob Woodward's book is a terrific summary and extraordinarily well reported as he does. And every one of you in here knows that there is no way his publisher, happens to be my publisher too, and there is no way that he is going to go to print without the lawyers being confident about sources and what he's done. He has hundreds of hours of tapes. So people need to be careful what they wish for in terms of documentation here. And you'll, you're going to hear denials here and denials there, but I think everybody knows how it works. Um, I, my book is 
the sort of, okay, it's terrible. We now have the facts that document what is happening, but what do we do about it? And what should America look like? What should we be doing in terms of making our system work and bringing ourselves back to ground zero dem democratically, little d? And um, I think my book, in the tracing of the things I've been involved in from the beginning of my raising my right hand, there's a chapter called Raising My Right Hand where I talk about why I went into the service. My, my parents were greatest generation parents. My mother, uh, born in Paris, uh, lived the better part of her early year, not the better part, all of her early life in Europe because my grandfather was a, was a businessman involved in uh, business in Europe at the time, lived between England and France right up until World War II. And uh, actually way back when, he was involved with Pietro Giannini in the founding of the Bank of America and to my regret, sold his stock too early. <laughs> uh, but, uh, so my mother didn't come to America really until she's about 24 years old. But she's American. She comes from a Boston family and, and she lived there. And that introduced me to war at a very young stage. I write in the book about how my earliest memory is walking with my mother in France, 1947, I was four years old, and holding her hand and she was crying. And I didn't know why she was crying. It upset me, but I could feel the, I could hear the glass crunching beneath my feet as we walked through the ruins of what had been a family home. And all that I remember was seeing a chimney go up into the sky and a, and a stairwell going up into the sky. That was all that was left. Um, so I remember visiting the beaches of Normandy four years after the war. There was still the detritus of war on those beaches you know, blown out tanks and so forth, Higgins boats. And it became, it, it, it just imbued me with a sense of service, sense of duty, sense of responsibility. And a group of us at Yale, uh, my good friend Freddie Smith, the founder of FedEx, who founded FedEx really in our dormitory when he got a C on his economics paper, that's, <laughs> you know, that was FedEx. Um, and it's an A plus now, folks. <laughs> A plus plus. Uh, and and my roommate Danny Barbiero went into the Marines, and and you know a whole bunch of us felt a sense of responsibility. 1965, Lyndon Johnson asked for troops, and and we were part of that answer. So I write this because I think all of that journey, without any arrogance, without any sense of wow, look at me or something. That's not what it's about. I think it's an American story. I think it's an American journey, and I think it represents how you make America the best of, of what we know it can be. Because in 1971, we had a president who broke the law, and, and we had a president who was, had an enemies list and who attacked uh, governance and attacked people. Uh, we had bombs going off in communities in America. We had pipe bombs. We had streets burning. We had assassination of Ed Medgar Evers, Robert Kennedy, uh, Martin Luther King. It was a tough time, folks. But we made it through it, and we got stronger because of it. So my book is that journey of, of how you strengthen our country, how you make the system work. When I was in Washington, uh, I was known as an outsider because I took on... Uh, administration. I mean, I took on the Reagan administration. I'm the one who blew the whistle on Iran-Contra. I'm the one who blew the whistle on Alba North. I'm the one who blew the whistle on the bank of BCCI and Clark Clifford's great engagement in it and, um, and, and the narcotics uh, trafficking that was taking place with Manuel Noriega and so forth. So I'm proud of that. That came out of my prosecutorial years when we also changed an old county office and made it modern and made it work. These are the things that I think matter today is how do you make our system work? I believe that my book is, a, is, a, is an explicit roadmap for what we need to do now to get our country back get our government back, not for Democrats, not for Republicans, conservatives or liberals, but for the American people writ large. And, and I think that what we're witnessing in Washington where members of another party uh, know exactly how bad things are. They know how, how 
this president is or isn't making policy. They know how unhinged it is. They know that the White House that's been described by that anonymous op-ed or by Woodward's book is the White House reality. And the, the fact is that there are people who know better, who raise their right arm and hand to take an oath of office to uphold the Constitution of the United States who are not doing that, uh, literally. They, they're servants to power, to president, and to party, not to the Constitution, and not to the institution itself. That's what we have to rectify, and I hope my book helps to point out how you do that. And your book does lay out an enormous record of uh, fights and striving to make change and make better policy and make the democracy work. So let's go back and start at the beginning. You first became active politically uh, for Vietnam veterans against the war. When you Actually, I first became active on Earth Day. Okay. That was my first organizational speaking involvement. When we, we had 20 million, some of you may have been among them. Uh, I see a few gray hairs out there somewhere. <laughs> Uh, we had uh, 20 million Americans came out of their homes and said, inspired by Rachel Carson and Silent Spring, we said, you know, we don't want to live next to a toxic waste site. We don't want to get cancer from the air we breathe or the dump nearby. Perfectly legitimate aspirations, I think. And, um, the, we, but we didn't stop when 20 million people came out of their homes. What we did was, we, we determined we had to make the issues we were organizing around voting issues. And so we targeted the 12 worst votes in the Congress, labeled them the dirty dozen, worst votes on the environment, and targeted them in the campaign. And guess what? In the next election, 1972, seven of the 12 lost their seats. That was it, folks. The dam broke because all the survivors suddenly had chills running up and down their spines that they better get on board. So we passed the Clean Air Act, Safe Drinking Water Act, Marine Mammal Protection Act, Coastal Zone Management Act, and Richard Nixon was forced to sign the EPA into existence. We didn't even have an EPA in America back then. So we changed the face of our country in that election in 72, in which, by the way, Richard Milhouse Nixon was reelected with 49 states. But we kept going, and our media kept going in terms of accountability to the truth. Bob Woodward and, and, you know, and, and, and uh, Watergate. And so a year and a half later, Richard Nixon was gone. And we had the Watergate class of 1974. So we, I think, have proven historically how you can have accountability in America. And this is a moment where we desperately need a course correction and we need to have accountability. So let's jump forward that environmental activism did bring about great change. This week we're having the climate summit here in San Francisco. Do you see, and, and a lot of people are very frustrated at not being able to get government to take needed steps to uh, reduce global warming and for the U.S. to play a more responsible role. Do you see activism and the type of events going on here in the Bay Area this week as making a difference on climate change? Oh, absolutely. Change? What's happening here is critical. I mean, it's really important, and it's also important leadership. I mean, I give credit to, to my friend Jerry and to Mike Bloomberg. I uh, worked with both of them on this subject for some period of time. Uh, uh, and I've worked on the issue of climate change for 30 plus years. You know, when I was lieutenant governor, uh, I was made chairman. I was the only lieutenant governor in the country to serve as chair of a governor's task force. And I had uh, John Sununu in New Hampshire and Dick Celeste in Ohio working with me. And we, did a good, we, we came up with a solution to acid rain. And it was a market-driven solution called cap and trade, which subsequently has been taken by some of the right wing and made a boogeyman of American political remedies for political reasons, sadly, because it's a market-based system that the AI, AEI, actually, the American Enterprise Institute came up with, uh, really conservative born, and we implemented it. 
And you don't hear about acid rain today because that trading system in, in, those, in sulfur has worked and it has reduced the, the challenge that was killing our lakes and streams and rivers and so forth. Um, but what's happening here, folks, I, I'm going to be the little bit the skunk at the garden party and I'm going to be speaking tomorrow and I'm going to speak, uh, I'm speaking this afternoon at a couple of events on the ocean. Um, I'm driven by science on this. Al Gore and I and Tim Wirth and a group, Frank, Frank Lautenberg and people, uh, John Chafee, Republican, John Warner, Republican, were among the early disciples of trying to do something. So we went down to Rio, 1992, uh, and George Herbert Walker Bush, to his credit, with Bill Riley as the head of the EPA, were on board. He agreed to and signed the original framework agreement on climate, which was voluntary back in 1992. And I've been to all the other conferences of the parties through the years, almost all of them, uh, in uh, Poland and in you know, Denmark and wherever, uh, where we've negotiated. And I was in Kyoto. In fact, I was responsible for managing the Kyoto Treaty on the floor of the Senate. And we couldn't move it. We couldn't move it because China wasn't part of the solution. And the other developing countries weren't. And everybody's, and all the politicians who hated the idea of it said, whoa, we're not gonna have America sign up to this if China and these other countries aren't gonna do something, even though the countries that were required to do something represented about 85% of all emissions back then. So we, we had to strike a new bargain, which is what I set out to do when I became Secretary of State. As Secretary of State, I went to China within six weeks of becoming Secretary. And I had decided, and I had a good relationship with the Chinese. I had worked with uh, Xia Xinhua, who is the Chinese counterpart on, on climate, for a number of years as chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee and otherwise. And we uh, agreed that we need to try to change the dynamic. China was leading the so-called G77, the undeveloped countries, in refusing to step up and be held accountable to do something about climate, even as they were climbing up to be the number two economy in the world. So I said, we got to change this equation. In Copenhagen, we failed miserably, and nothing was happening. Well, I went to China. I met with President Xi and all the Chinese leadership, and I talked about what was happening in China. And I knew in China that Chinese citizens were increasingly where we were back in 1960s not wanting to live near dirty water and breathe bad air. You can't even breathe in Beijing. So, uh, you know, we persuaded the Chinese and said, look, let's, let's agree to work to come up with a mechanism by which we can all work together. And they did. They came on board. One year later, because of the hard work we did to develop an approach, President Xi and President Obama stood up in Beijing and announced what the United States and China's intended emissions reductions would be to deal with climate change so we could go to Paris and get an agreement. And then we focused on Paris. I was in Paris for two weeks negotiating the Paris Agreement. And we came up with a mechanism where every country would design its own approach. And that is what we passed. Each country offering its national target for reduction of emissions. Um, it was a very emotional moment when the plenary session in Paris came, came together and the, it was announced uh, by my friend Laura Fabius, the president of the, of the meeting, that it was adopted. And what I argued in a very tense meeting a couple nights earlier when it almost fell apart as people were arguing to go back to the old formula about developed countries doing more and less developed countries, which is a, a killer formula, I pointed out that this was the single most egalitarian shared responsibility you could have. Why? Because each country decided itself what it was going to do. And no country decided to do anything that it couldn't do. That's why President Trump outright lied to Americans the day he pulled out because he stood up in front of the country and said, this agreement puts too great a burden on the United States. And the answer is, no, it didn't. It only undertook to do what we knew we could do with the support 
<clears throat> of major Fortune 500 companies ranging from the Googles and the Apples and so forth all the way to ExxonMobil and BP and others, all of them said, we need to do this. So we came out of Paris. So what was the significance of Paris? The significance of Paris is that we basically put our faith in the private sector, <clears throat> which I believe I've, I've grown more and more private sector oriented over the years because as you watch the world changing, as the dynamic changes, we're witnessing, we're witnessing um, industrial revolution sized changes in culture and society and workplace in trade and in, in globalization. But it's happening at digital pace. It's unprecedented. And that's part of the anger that has filled American workers and the American people because they feel increasingly disenfranchised and shocked and shell-shocked by it all. Uh, and that's a lot of the voter that Donald Trump appealed to. By the way, it's also a voter that Bernie Sanders appealed to. And it's out there. It's also in the center. You don't have to be on the right or left to feel that way. Government is not working in America, folks. And we can go into some of the reasons why and what we have to do about it. But the bottom line with respect to climate change is we were trying to send a message in Paris to the private sector. 196 countries are all going to move in the same direction at the same time. And that creates the largest market the world has ever seen, the energy market. <clears throat> and why energy? Because energy is the solution to climate change. There's nothing we can't do to, to <coughs> excuse me, change the course we're on that isn't subject to making better decisions about how we create electricity, what we do with our buildings, how we, <coughs> how we burn oil or gas or you know, coal and other things, and how we move to a renewable, sustainable future. The market that I knew in Massachusetts, I represented Massachusetts 28 years, we had a terrific tech base, not quite Silicon Valley, but uh, in the early years, very, very strong and still strong. <coughs> and we had a $1 trillion market in the 1990s with about a hundred, with, with what, uh, 1 billion users. The energy market is today a 4 to 5 billion user market and a multi-trillion dollar market and it's going to grow to 9 billion users in the next 30 years. It's the biggest market the world has ever seen. And by Donald Trump pulling out of Paris, he's pulled us out of a position of leadership in, the, in that market. So, but here's the rub. This is why I said I'm going to be the skunk. Paris' goal was to keep the rise in the Earth's temperature to 2 degrees centigrade. We're probably right around 1.3, 1.5 already today. We're right there. But my friends, <clears throat> in this century, my grandchildren, yours, <coughs> are going to live to experience a 4 degree rise in temperature. Four degrees is what we are on track to see now. What you see barreling towards the coast of the Carolinas today, the size of the storm, the intensity, the rapidity with which it formed, is a direct consequence of the warming of the water and the increase of the moisture that you have, therefore, in the air, and therefore more rain. Harvey, Irma, and Maria all deposited one storm Harvey alone deposited as much water as flows over Niagara Falls in an entire year, five days of flooding. And Irma was the first storm to have a recorded 185 miles an hour sustained for 24 hours. Together, these storms cost us $265 billion, one-third of the entire budget of the Defense Department, and more money than the Commerce Department, the Energy Department, the Education Department, the, the whole bunch of departments together. This is insanity. Insanity. As Secretary of State, I went to Norfolk, Virginia, the largest Navy base in the world, and we talked with the military about what they're having to do because of the preparations they need to make because of climate change and the rise of sea level. I went to Antarctica, as I mentioned. <laughs> Not to fire my bolt. But I went because when I went to the Arctic, the scientists there said, Mr. Secretary, you got to go in Antarctica to really understand what's happening in terms of the changes. So I went to Antarctica. 
And lo and behold, yeah, I heard from scientists from 17 different countries about the rapidity with which the West Antarctic ice sheet, which is three and a half miles deep ice, is melting and, and shows a fissure. The Larsen ice sheet broke off, larger than the size of the state of Rhode Island, and floated out to sea. And they're afraid that the whole thing may melt the way we're going. The Himalayan glaciers are melting. Our glaciers are disappearing. All over the world we're seeing the diminishment of, the, of this cycle. And now you have an open sea in, in the Northwest Passage in the summertime, and people trying to exploit it. I mean, it's changed. Last year, for the first time in history, we recorded above freezing temperatures in the Arctic in February. So, you know, I get angry when I, when I think about this. Donald Trump's decision to pull out of that agreement is going to cost lives. It just is. And it's going to cost billions of dollars of damage to property. And you're going to witness some of it in the next hours and next days. But that's just the beginning. We've had an average of seven hurricanes a year since 1972 in the Atlantic, which is more than normal. And now there are two other hurricanes behind Florence that are sort of building out there. So my friends, what do you do about it? What is the solution we ought to be doing? Well, I'll tell you what. The President of the United States, I mean, if I were President today, I would have an emergency meeting of the G20. I'd take the richest countries in the world, and I'd say, we're not leaving this room till we put together a climate action fund that helps less developed countries not have to build a coal-fired power plant. And we should stop every single coal-fired power plant in the world from being built. That's what we have to do. Why? It's the dirtiest fuel in the world. And it is the single biggest culprit with respect to global climate change. And we're at a point now where we are locked in, not just to preventing this from happening, we're locked into mitigation and adaptation. So we're going to have to do things like the Dutch do to prevent the sea from coming into a, into a country that's below sea level. But guess what? A lot of other places are going to find that challenge. Already the mayor of Miami is pumping water out of Miami Beach the mayor of Miami Beach, not Miami, is pumping water out in order to get sunny day, high tide flooding out of the way. So we have water coming over the Boston, uh, in, in, in Boston at the seawall, you know, that comes in at a high tide, sunny day now. So my friends, long answer to you, but I've got to tell you something. This is the, one of the most serious issues we face. It is existential. It is solvable. There's no excuse for not moving more rapidly to alternative renewable energy. Solar is now completely competitive with coal. It's cheaper than coal because there's no, there's no truth in accounting. I don't know how many of you are in business, but you know there's no truth in accounting in, in, in this business today. People say, oh, coal is uh, three or four cents a, a kilowatt hour and solar is going to be six or something. Well, solar isn't now. Solar is letting contracts in the world at 2.9 cents per kilowatt hour and so forth. But coal, which doesn't ever take in the cost of coal sludge, coal dust, black lung, moving it by train or car or truck from wherever it comes from, the burning, the cost of emphysema, the cost of, of, of you know, the single biggest cost of children being hospitalized in America during the summer is environmentally induced asthma. We spend $55 billion a year to deal with it. And we can't find $100 billion to fund the Clean Climate Fund. So I'm just telling you folks, we're the greatest democracy in the world. We're not making choices about the future. We've got to start to reclaim our democracy and reclaim our future by making real choices. It's that simple. And we're experiencing a lot of the impacts here in California. We've had a couple hundred thousand acres gone up in flames this last year. The smoke, the health consequences of the smoke. Uh, we have a seawall issue here in San Francisco and so on. So if, in fact, our ability to accomplish these things at the federal level is impaired at this point, there's a certain amount of uh, thought that states are going to have to take the lead. Uh, and I think that's Jerry Brown's attitude. He's just uh, announced a, an objective of having uh, California run completely on clean fuels by the year 2045. So what do you think about this idea that the, the unit of, the political unit for focus is really states at this point? 
Well, states have always been known as the laboratories, uh, not the federal government. Um, and I'm a huge supporter of that, particularly right now. Um, when we knew that Trump was about to pull out of the Paris Accord, I got on the phone, a whole bunch of us got on the phone. And um, in fact, the day, it ha the day before it happened, I said, you know, I got to reserve a website called, you know, Live by Paris. And uh, then uh, the governors started talking about the we're still in movement, et cetera. So we all joined together. <coughs> and I was in New York with Andrew Cuomo and, and Governor Inslee and others. And, and um, we all announced we're, gonna, we're still in. Now, that's the critical thing. <coughs> I'm sorry, this is environmentally induced, folks. Uh, <laughs> I'm not kidding. Um, yeah, we've had a lot. It, this is, the year is a little smoky here. Um, so, uh, we announced that we're still in, and here's what's exciting about it. Um, 38 states in the United States have what's called a renewable portfolio law. And nine of those states, I believe, are voluntary. The, the 29 or 28 or so are mandatory, which means that X amount of their power production has to be done in a sustainable way by a certain period of time. And we're building on that and building on it here at the summit to have a whole bunch of different things happening that keeps us on track to try to achieve Paris. So this is great what's happening here. Uh, in the sense that uh, people are going to try in earnest to to do the Paris Accord, and last year, uh, last year, seventy five percent of the new electricity that came online in the United States of America was solar power. You know what coal was? Zero point two percent. That's where Trump's concept of coal is, because the market is making the decision. The challenge is, I have no doubt we're going to get there uh, somewhere in 2030, 2050, whatever it is. My doubt is whether or not we have the willpower to do it fast enough to save us from the worst consequences of climate change. Why do I say that? Because there is what scientists call the tipping point. You may get to a point where the cascading of, never, of negative effects are not susceptible to being turned around quickly or easily. And, and I gotta tell you, I just have a basic personal sense, I'm sure you do too, that when you talk about planet Earth, you talk about Mother Nature, uh, you talk about God's creation, however you want to view it, uh, it's fragile because it is an ecosystem. Everything depends on everything else. You know, the whole food chain, the production chain. Uh, we, the biggest single sink, sink is something that absorbs carbon dioxide. The biggest single sink in the world is the ocean. Something like 75% of all the carbon dioxide, 90% of the carbon dioxide that comes, that's in the, goes in, in, it's stored in the ocean. And a few years ago, scientists noticed for the first time in Antarctica, by the way, regurgitation of some of that. It was kicking it back out. So we don't know where the saturation point is. We don't know where that tipping point is. We don't know if the ecosystem gets to be in a place where, because of the pollution in the water, this is another thing, I'm a pet project of mine, the oceans, you know, not 50%, 51% of the oxygen we breathe comes from the ocean. And we're not protecting the oceans. We're filling it with plastic. There will be more plastic than fish in the ocean at the rate we're going in about 20 years. We're overfishing every fishing stock in the world. All of this is controllable with leadership that wants to do it. So when I was secretary, we started an ocean conference called Our Oceans. And we had the first one three years ago. The second one was in Chile. The Chileans decided to do it. The third one, I did it again right before I left as secretary in Washington. <clears throat> the next one was done in Europe, in Malta, by the EU. The next one is this year. In a few weeks, we're going to Bali where the Indonesians are hosting it. The year after that, the Norwegians are hosting it. The year after that, the Russians want to host it. So this thing has gained a life because people understand we've got to gain responsibility with government enforcement of our fisheries, with oversight to pollution, all these other things. But this is all a critical component 
of of uh, honoring, of respecting the concept of an ecosystem. I don't know who's asking. I don't know if any of you here wrote a letter to the president and asked him to take the limits off of methane. Or if any of you here wrote to say, Mr. President, we really want more coal sludge in our, in our, in our fuel. And by the way, why don't you just roll back the automobile standards so we can have cities that we no longer can see across the city in. I mean, this is where we're heading. This is the most shocking, stunning abdication of public responsibility in favor of some corporate entity, I don't know which, or some donor in the political system. And it's an insult to our intelligence. And it threatens this ecosystem. So bottom line, uh, we've really got to focus on the upside benefits of protecting that system. The, the largest market in the world, think about it, we can create millions of jobs building an actual energy grid for America. Did you know we don't have an energy grid in America? You can produce wind power in Minnesota or in Iowa, and I've seen all those windmills in the farms because the farmers make money off renting them out now. And, and, and uh, you can't send it to other parts of the country. We waste a lot of it. We could have much lesser demand for fossil fuel-based energy if we, if we did that more effectively. But we have a great big hole in the middle of the country. And we have an East Coast grid, a West Coast grid. Uh, there's a line that goes across from Chicago to the Dakotas. And then, of course, Texas has its own grid. Uh, that's it. Uh, I don't know. It, it troubles me at times. I rode on a train in China that goes 300 miles an hour. A steward put a glass of water on the table of the train when it was going full speed, and it wasn't rippling as much as that is. And it took us half an hour from go Beijing to the coast. We could, we've got the uh, regional uh, Amtrak in, in Washington. We've got the Acela together with it, the higher end one. But you know the Acela can go 155 miles an hour, but you know how much of the trip from Washington to New York it does that? 18 miles. Can't go fast under the Baltimore Tunnel because the vibrations may collapse the tunnel. Can't go fast over the bridges of the Chesapeake because you may wind up in the Chesapeake. <laughs> I mean, folks, we are the country that invented the internet, went to the moon, that does, we're not doing it. I can't name one major national infrastructure program in the United States of America. The two biggest projects are Jerry Brown trying to build a high-speed rail out here. That's a state project. And the rebuilding of LaGuardia Airport now, which is a Port Authority project. Uh, I, I, I think Americans would get excited about rebuilding America and being the world's leader in our infrastructure and our capacity to move people and goods. Look at the traffic. You can't go to a city in America that isn't gridlocked. I, cu I couldn't believe New York the other day. Uh, I mean, it's stunning. But think about it. How many hours do we waste in a car getting somewhere? How many... Uh, how many gallons of gasoline do we waste going two miles an hour inching on a moving parking lot? We're not trying to do better in these kinds of things, and we can and we should. So. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I get wound up on it. I, yeah. It's all right. So we have these agenda items, whether it's uh, mass transportation or climate change, health care that we need to address. Uh, and we we have a difficulty doing this at the national level. So let's talk about our political process. What are the ingredients of the, the gridlock, the political gridlock? You uh, talk about your years in the Senate and the change that came about in 94 and the next few years where you have some choice ways of describing how the Senate moved to from de t dealing with issues to a group of people who want to, to pontificate and paint one another as wrong rather than getting something accomplished. Um, so what, what has changed in American politics at the most fundamental level, and how do we fix it? Well, I think there are four or five principal reasons we, we are where we are today. Um, and I'll give you a few. I'll give you maybe three or four of them quickly. Number one, the amount of money in American politics is a disgrace. It is setting the agenda. Uh, 
It is stealing the voice of average people in our country, and it is derailing uh, the real agenda of our nation and making it very difficult for people to be heard, number one. Number two, gerrymandering is undemocratic, and it destroys, <laughs> it destroys our ability to have a legitimately democratic general election. People in the Congress fear primaries more than they fear the general election. And primaries have now been used as a weapon against colleagues by fellow senators and congressmen. If the Freedom Caucus wants to, you know, through one group or another say, we're going to primary you, you vote that way or you don't shut up about that and join us in this, it's lost all collegiality. And I describe in my book the Senate that I came into, uh, which was excessively male. Uh, there were as many women in the United States Senate when I came there as I have daughters, two. Uh, and one of them was defeated in the next election, Paula Hawkins of Florida, so it came down to one. Now there are a lot more and it's been a tremendous transition and change. In fact, I'll share with you, I don't know if I guess I can say this here, I don't know, it's in the book anyway. Um, when I first walked on to the floor of the Senate, there were five male senators in the back of the Senate talking with each other. And Teddy Kennedy escorted me in, and, and, and this is a big moment, you know, you're walking Are you in. actually going to use those words? Can I? I don't know about the radio, but in any case. Are we on radio? Okay. Well, we... we, we All right, here's the deal. Go ahead. Buy the book, read it. Okay. It's, it's actually, the old... This was not a setup. It wasn't. I promise actually, you. Actually, we do have a bleeper, so... No, I don't uh, want to bleep it. But anyway, uh, so... The senators are in the back. I walk up to them, and, and big old Hal Heflin from Alabama is there. He says, George Bush, George Herbert Walker Bush was vice president. He was sitting up in the chair, and they're swearing about swearing everybody. And he says, uh, he, said, he said, George Bush couldn't sell and then think of what Donald Trump said in the Billy Bush interview <laughs> on a troop train. <laughs> Does that handle it for you? It, it, is, it is in the book. I... Uh, and, and I said to myself, God, that didn't come from the Federalist Papers. <laughs> Where am I? This is the veneered, you know, venerable United States Senate. It was a pretty male place, and, and I got advice from, the, from one senator. Uh, you know, you better go see these two senators before 4.30 in the afternoon, because you see them after 4.30, they won't remember what they committed to the next day. <laughs> I mean, it was a different place. But I'd go to dinner at... Ted's house or John Warner somewhere. Mac Mathias, Republican from Maryland, would be there. John Warner, Republican from Virginia, would be there. Orrin Hatch from Utah. We'd sit around, Democrat and Republican. We'd laugh. We'd talk to each other. We had a great time. And we'd talk about serious issues. And the next day in the Senate, we might pass an amendment based on that conversation. That's gone. They don't even have time to go to dinner anymore. In fact, they don't even report to work that long. They come in Monday night, Tuesday, gone Thursday, because they've got to go out and raise money somewhere around the country. we got to fix that, folks. We've got to get, and we tried. For 18 years in the United States Senate, I never took a dime of PAC money. I always went out and raised from individual Americans. But it, and I said, I won't change that until we get some reform in the system. Well, we got some reform, and I changed it because I simply couldn't continue to put all my time into going around the country to run a campaign, multi-million dollar campaign for the Senate, until, you know, finally we changed enough. But then it got changed backwards when the Supreme Court ruled uh, in the Citizens United case that speech is money. We have to change that. Uh, that's the only way we're gonna get it back. So no, we're wrong. Not the only way, but it's the best way we could have the most significant impact. We're gonna, we're, I think we can get it back in two months with a course correction election. I believe that. So, uh, minor note, the Commonwealth Club doesn't take positions or support legislation or anything like that, but about 15 years ago, we perceived the problem in California with gerrymandering, and we uh, started a project which eventually led to the founding here of something called the Citizens Commission on Redistricting, which took redistricting out of the hands of the state legislature where the parties were creating safe seats for one another. So that has been functioning here in California. Uh, we, we, the organization, we offloaded an organization that then 
uh, was more politically active than the Commonwealth Club. But um, that is a good government step and could well be copied in other states. Well, a lot of what California has done is being copied in other states and could be, and that's one, and I congratulate you on it. So um, That's why you guys have been here for 115 years. So, Not you personally. So that's true. Yes. I, although I, I'm getting close. I'm getting close. I see all the white hair. So, um, well, so she's been here for 22 years, folks. Pretty amazing, I have to tell you. Thank you. <clears throat> so, so that's the problem. Uh, and what are more of the solutions uh, in terms of reclaiming our... The yeah. our, our national democracy and... Well, let me come to the third element of the answer to the last thing, and then I won't go into the other pieces of it, but the most significant other piece, just quickly for you, is the lack of a baseline on facts in America today. <laughs> and if you can't establish a baseline on facts, it is extraordinarily hard to have a democratic process that can make decisions and build consensus. That's a different story about social media, media in general, education, whole bunch of things. I don't want to, I'm not going to get stuck there right now. But the third thing that is the most critical, and, and I'll tell you this bluntly, um, the rules of the United States Senate have not changed appreciably, significantly, so that that's a reason that you can't do things. The Senate was designed by our founding fathers to deal with a moment like this. And the single biggest thing that I think has changed are the people. It's people who are willing to put party ahead of country. It's people who don't have a sense of responsibility about statesmanship. It's people who, I mean, take what Mitch McConnell said, for instance, by the way, about Barack Obama. What's your agenda for the year? The agenda of the Republican Party of the United States Senate is to make Barack Obama one-term one one -term president. Well, if that's the agenda, we got a problem. And that was accompanied by the nomination of a person who spent a whole lot of time gaining notoriety by saying Barack Obama wasn't an American, wasn't born in the United States. I mean, think about this. If that's what a party is reduced to in its purpose, that's the problem, and that comes from people. It comes from people. I think it started a little bit with Richard Nixon and the Southern Strategy and Dick Vigory and Direct Mail, names from the past but it extended and, and went further, and both parties have made contributions to it in fights that took place in the Senate for one reason or another. There are arguments about what happened to John Tower, nominated as Secretary of Defense. There are arguments about what happened to Robert Bork, blah, blah, blah. But really, it took hold in the 1990s. With the Gingrich Revolution, people, be I saw this, people began to come over to the Senate who were just more ready to say ideology first, one way, my way or the highway, little you know, less involvement. And you have people who've tried to buck that a little bit. Jeff Flake from Arizona and, and Bob Corker a little bit from Tennessee. Uh, but it's been tough. It's been tough. But I believe, you ask me, what can we do? Look, folks, I hope, don't let this sound naive, because I think in my book, as you, you'll see the, the continuum, that people make the difference. Every one of the major movements that made change happen when it needed to in the late 1960s, civil rights, Martin Luther King, kids, some of my classmates, we raised money for the freedom buses, the freedom rides. We had people get on those buses and go down south to register people uh, to vote in, in Mississippi and Alabama places. The Mississippi Voter Registration Drive drove us. Motivated and run really in large measure by young people. The environment movement, young people. The anti-war movement, Sam Brown, David Mixner, bunch of people, young people did that. Marge Klenkar. These kids, they took time off from school. They went and made a difference. I believe in that still. We called them the peanut butter and jelly brigade. They went up to New Hampshire. They, they supported Gene McCarthy. They sent a message to, to the President of the United States, Lyndon Johnson. You shouldn't run again. 
And it was after the March primary that Lyndon Johnson took himself out of it. So look at what I said about Earth Day. Look at what I said about environmental legislation. Look at what happened in terms of accountability for Watergate and then the Watergate babies who went to Congress and what we were able to do. So yeah, it moves slowly sometimes. It's not as responsive as you'd like to be. Winston Churchill said that democracy is the worst form of government except for everything else. <laughs> Think about it. We've tried everything in the world, ladies and gentlemen. We've had dictatorships all over the place. We had a monarch for a while here till we threw off the yoke of that. We've had constitutional monarchy. We've had parliamentary monarchy. We've had socialism. We've had communism. We've had you name it. We've, we've, we've seen it experimented with one place or another. And I still believe very, very deeply that if you work at it properly and, and the public is able to hold people and things accountable and you go vote, uh, you can make a difference. And here's the magic number, 54.2. That is the percentage of eligible Americans who voted in 2016. When Barack Obama was elected in 2008, it was 62.3%. When he was reelected against Romney, it was 58.5, I think. So you see the gap. The story of the last election is not the people who did go out to vote for Donald Trump, it's the people who didn't vote. And 9% of Barack Obama's vote went to Trump, and 7% did not come out and vote. That's 16%. Look at that swing. That's why I believe, as I sit here today, I'm not kidding you, I'm not Pollyanna-ish, I'm not being naive. We can make our democracy work. But it is work. It's hard work. You have to go out and be part of a campaign. You have to drive people to go vote. You have to go vote yourself. You've got to give money to a campaign so it can compete. You've got to take part in it. And, and I just ask you, remember the words of Ben Franklin when he walked down the steps of Constitution Hall after they had finished their labor on the next iteration of the Constitution of the United States. And a woman shouted at him, Dr. Franklin, tell us, what do we have? And he said back to her, oh, she said, do we have a monarchy or a republic? And he said, a republic, if you can keep it. If you can keep it. That's the work of today. I, I kid you not. John McCain, you've talked about other colleagues in the Senate. Uh, a Republican, an aisle crosser at times. You had a long relationship. He was your fellow Vietnam veteran. What do you have to say about John McCain and how, how you worked with him and, and your relationship with him over the years? Well, I miss him, as, as I think America will miss him, because he was a, a truth teller. Uh, he knew he had some deviations himself. One was on climate change when he was running for president because of the orthodoxy of his party. And he was upfront about those kinds of, of things, which is one of the things people appreciated about him. Um, but uh, he, uh, he had, a, as I wrote in an op-ed after he passed away, he had, a, he had a great capacity for forgiveness, which is, which is partly what you need uh, and what we need in our politics a little bit in the country. Um, John and I didn't know each other well when we went to the Senate. I got to the Senate before John, which I tried not to let him forget any given day. And um, we, it was about two years apart, and he came to campaign against me in Massachusetts, though he never attacked me, he never mentioned my name, he just talked with the other guy. And I write in the book about how that sort of was the way the game was played back then, not anymore, but then. But in the Senate, we were one day we were on a delegation flying to Kuwait after a, a desert storm. And uh, Kuwait was just liberated, and we flew over to uh, talk to the troops and thank them, but also to talk to the emir and the other folks and see where we were going. Um, John and I were seated opposite each other. He was flying backwards, I was flying forwards, sitting opposite him, which we were assigned by seniority. That's why it was important I got there before him. Uh, and, we started, you know, we, we were uncomfortable a little bit because I was the war protester and he was the POW. So 
we started to talk about the Navy. We're both Navy guys, and we both love the Navy. I love the Navy. Uh, didn't like the war, but loved the Navy. And um, we talked about, I, I asked him about Annapolis and what it was like to have a grandfather and a father, four-star admirals, the weight of that, what did that affect him in the, in the, in the academy, and blah, blah, blah. So we had an amazing conversation that night, but out of it came a willful, determined commitment by the two of us, which we made that night on that plane, that we were going to work together. Because we both agreed that the war was still tearing America apart. This is 1980, this is 1990, 91. And so we decided we were going to work together to try to make peace. Peace with Vietnam and peace with ourselves in America. And it began with the sort of ability to look beyond how we felt about each other's positions on the war. He was pro-war. He, he came back as of upset at the people who were protesting the war because his war stopped the day he was shot down, 1967. And he had to hang on to everything he had and believed for all those years in a prison camp. My war was 1968 and 69. And when I came back, I got to go around the country and argue against the war. So we came from very different places. But my friends, we we found the most amazing common ground. We worked together for 10 years to try to change Vietnam. We ultimately did. We first, with George Herbert Walker Bush, we lifted the embargo with President Clinton. We normalized. Uh, we, we, we most significantly answered the questions for 700 families to date about what happened to their loved ones in Vietnam because we set up the most in-depth, intrusive accountability system to be able to know what happened to somebody in a last seen, last known alive report. And there was a mythology, remember, in the early 1990s. The cover of Newsweek had, are they still alive? Prisoners in Vietnam in tiger cages. And there was a mythology through the Rambo films that we'd forgotten people over there. So we had to undo that first. And we went to amazing lengths to do it. We went back to Vietnam. I went back with John McCain. We, we, we had helicopters flying into hamlets where the sound of a helicopter would bring back horrible memories of the war. We, we had uh, history houses. We'd go in and talk to the people. We actually interviewed General Jop, and we interviewed the jailers of John McCain and, his, and the fellow prisoners. So we had this most exhaustive effort. And in the end, ladies and gentlemen, I'm so proud that, that, that not only did we get the answers, and that's ongoing today. Today, as we're sitting here in this theater, the, 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 we got American soldiers on the ground in Vietnam trying to get remains back for families. And, and John McCain and I visited the cell he was in together. We stood together. And, and I realized then that we had found this special common ground. And if a POW and a protester can do that about Vietnam in Hanoi, we can do that anywhere in this country and make things better. So it's, it's a great story about what people can do. Um, and so turning to another Asian country with which we have a fraught relationship, if you were Secretary of State, what would you be doing about North Korea today? Well, we did. You know, there's not a great... I mean, there's a dissimilarity in style and in process, but in objective and basic approach, we, we wanted to try to sit down with North Korea. We, we tried very hard to get the North Koreans to come to the table. Uh, but we were tougher in wanting certain definitions defined before we did so. Mind you, Kim Jong-un's father and grandfather both wanted a meeting with the President of the United States, and they never got it. Why did they never get it? Because we were never able to get satisfaction with respect to what they were willing to define or not define. Uh, and and uh, I think the, that Donald Trump was just in such a rush to have the glitz of the meeting and have the theater of the event. There just wasn't the groundwork done to be able to get a communique that actually defined what denuclearization meant for all the parties, or how you would have a first step you'd begin to take that you both agreed on that could give confidence to the world that you're moving in a serious way to deal with the problem. So I think that was missing, which is why there's now chatter about another meeting. 
to see if there's a way to make up for it. But the basics of getting China to put more pressure, we tried to do, and we did. We got China to ratchet up its sanctions on two occasions. We ran out of time. We urged the Trump administration to continue to put sanctions on and to ratchet them up, and they did. So there were two more iterations of raised sanctions, at which point the diplomacy of the president, the new president of South Korea, with the Christmas process, brought a new possibility, and it kind of forced the administration into having to deal because they weren't ready to and didn't want to otherwise. So they began this, this process of, uh, of a dialogue. I'm hopeful it can work, folks. It's in everybody's interests. I, don't, I want them to be successful. I hope they can get the definition. But most of the people who've worked on the issue of North Korea for 20 or 30 years really don't believe he's going to give up his weapons. And, and, that he, and the intelligence community now, contrary to the pronouncements of the president, are saying publicly that there's evidence of greater construction of bombs, more bombs, and that they're being moved around and hidden. And that's the problem with the absence of a declaration and of accountability. So we'd urge greater accountability. A personal question. Um, your grandfather on your father's side was Jewish. He converted to Catholicism. As with Madeleine Albright, you learned about this later in your life, and by the way, as with me as well, that my maternal grandfather was Jewish. As Madeleine Albright learned, uh, you did, you learned that some of your grandfather's immediate family had perished in the Holocaust. You are a strong Catholic. Did it make a difference to you to learn about this unknown or little known family history? And how do you incorporate these various strands in your own uh, philosophy and your own belief? Well, of course it would make, I mean, it makes a difference. The question is, how do you define that difference? And, 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 and yes, you, I mean, you need to incorporate. I welcomed it. I mean, it's, it's, in, it's incredible news, and it sort of fills out a kind of, uh, uh, you know, a background that, that uh, I think one has every reason to be proud of. It's part of the great American story. Uh, my grandfather left, I guess it was, it was what was then Czechoslovakia, or, or Czech, uh, in 1898, uh, he converted then to Catholicism, as did my grandmother. Uh, so my father was raised as a Catholic. Uh, and uh, my grandfather, and I suspect, you know that great line in Hamilton, in New York, you can be a new man. Mm -hmm. I, I suspect he, he wasn't able to be a new man. And he killed himself when my dad was six years old. So my dad really never knew his father. Uh, and, and a year later, his mother, his uh, sister, who was seven years older than him, 13 years old at the time, came down with polio. Uh, and so my grandmother, uh, my, my grandfather on that side had been a fairly successful businessman, left enough money that they went off to Europe to find a cure. And the next years, most of the 1920s, he write, my dad wrote, was spent traveling around Europe trying to find a cure. And my dad was plunked down at school, learned, I mean, went to school in Vienna, learned German, blah, blah, blah. So I thought all of that was intriguing. And I regretted that because they came over on a ship from Genoa in 19, gosh, I've forgotten the year. Isn't that amazing? Um, around 18, somewhere in there. Um, uh, and they came in at Ellis Island uh, and had that experience that so many Americans had had. And he first went to Chicago, then he went to Boston. So, uh, you know, when I learned that his sister and brother had been killed in the Holocaust and they went to one of the um, concentration camps, uh, that has to inform your life and connect you to uh, some realities. But it wasn't, you know, it's not a showstopper for me in the sense that some people might find it or think of it. Um, I write in the book a fair amount, not fair amount, but I guess a fair amount for somebody in public life about faith and my own journey through faith uh, and, you know, the, the uh, frustration, if not anger, that came out of the war and the loss of my friends and uh, the, 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 you know, 
questions about how you have a merciful God who does these kinds of things to people. It's an age-old question. I mean, I'm not the first person to have asked that question. And my dad asked that. I mean, my dad became extremely agnostic. So my Protestant mother, Rosemary Isabel Forbes, was the one who saw to my Catholic education, not my dad, whose obligation, in a sense, it was. And, um, you know, I think that... Uh, but I was very excited by my first communion, very excited by confirmation, very excited about prayer and early engagement. I was an altar boy for a period of time. And then, you know, came the years of, uh, of not feeling so good about it all and questioning it, et cetera. And I began to read a lot. When I got to the Senate, we have a Senate prayer breakfast, and I became involved in it and um, did a lot of reading, you know, Reinhold Niebuhr and, and Kant and Hegel and and the Pope, the Pope's encyclical, uh, Salvifici Dolores, and so forth. And I really dug in to find out how do you deal with the issue of suffering in the context of believing in an omnipresent, omnipotent God. Uh, and in the end, uh, I kind of landed where I land, which I write about in the book, which is a place of faith. But, you know, faith with some restraints about how human beings interpret things and thrust it on other people and how dogma can get in the way of people's ability to recognize things. But if I went back to college, I might well be uh, a comparative religion major because I find it absolutely intriguing when you look at the links in all the Abrahamic faiths. You look at the scriptures, you look at the Torah, you look at the, you know, I mean, the Bible and... and, and uh, you read the Quran, you, you, you see the similarities, you see these strains that each takes from the other and how the stories connect. And I find that absolutely fascinating. Um, so there's a streak of ecumenicism in me and a respect for how the questions people ask that made things happen, like Martin Luther nailing that treatise on the door uh, and the indulgences that forced him to do so and things like that. I find it's absolutely intriguing. Um, and that window opened up to me to some degree through the uh, early uh, explorations. You know, mm -hmm. it's fun. It's interesting stuff. There are so At many. At least to me, a hell of all of you. <laughs> there are so many stories in your book, and some of them very funny, actually. One having to do with the model of a fire plug and your wife. <laughs> but we don't have time to get into that. Oh, that's too bad. I'm sorry to hear that. I had some, I've, I've led a somewhat Forrest Gumpian life, folks. <laughs> I mean, really, uh, there's a story in there about how I walked in alone into a room where President Kennedy was. And President Kennedy and I chatted. I didn't even know you call him Mr. President. I said, hello, Mr. Kennedy. And, um, and we chatted, and I, you know, I'd write about, he just received his Yale degree, and I was just about to go to Yale, so we laughed about that. Um, I write about uh, introducing John Lennon at a rally, an anti-war rally in New York, and one of my cherished pictures, it's in the book, I think, is, is John Lennon and me right before the rally. And um, believe it or not, uh, at a hockey game I was playing, we, we still play these Christmas hockey games, and it's for age four to 74 thus far, and everybody's out there. We play with, uh, it's called broom hockey. We play with these sticks, but we play with a ball. And I was skating down the ice really hard, and some guy fell in front of me, and I didn't want to smash into him, so I dove over him, thinking I'd just slide on the ice and I'd be fine. But he started to get up before I'd cleared him. So as he got up, my legs went up, and my face went down, face plant, uh, unprotected, into the ice. Uh, and I could hear the crack all across the ice. Everybody heard it. So I was starting to bleed a little bit. I knew I'd broken my nose. And I get up, I turn around, and I look at the guy who had done it, and it was Tom Hanks, Forrest Gump. <laughs> I swear to God. And, uh, you know, I was trying to think, what do you say to him? You know, life is like a box of chocolates. <laughs> Stupid is as stupid does. Well, I didn't write that in the book, but I should have. Anyway. Well, um, you'll all have to look at the book in order to read these. Read the book. Stories. Don't look at it. That too. So uh, thanks so much to John Kerry. Well, it's a great pleasure to be with you. Thank you.
A reminder to our audience here, Secretary Kerry will be signing books on stage in just a few minutes. We have a few simple guidelines, so please stay seated for some further instructions. I'm Gloria Duffy, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned.